it's time to, we talked about the, the role of the citizen, we talked about um, the role of the campaigner, we now need to talk and say something about finance. Um, and maybe um, KPMG, which is one of you know, the, the, the four greatest uh, professional services companies all over the world, maybe they'll have something to say about that. So please, please welcome up Evo to come and address us all. Well, thank you and, uh, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm not exactly sure where I'm, why I'm here. Uh, <laughs> I hope you're sure why you're here. Um, as was said in the introduction, I, I now work for KPMG, which is a, a global advisory firm working with about 140,000 people, I think, working on pretty much every country of the world. Uh, and I, I'm responsible for their business on climate change and sustainability, which is about 500 people in teams in about 60 60 countries of the world, working mainly with, with corporates. And before that, I spent four years uh, suffering through the international climate change negotiations, uh, all the way up until the big climate change conference in, in Copenhagen. And before that, I spent about 15 years, I think, working on uh, environmental policy in Europe. So I could be here because of the European policy experience or because of the UN or because of the private sector, or because uh, of all three. Whichever it may be, it's a great pleasure to be with you here this afternoon. Uh, I hadn't actually planned to say anything about finance, but maybe we can touch on that uh, in, in the questions. Speaking of questions, I wanted to actually start with two questions. And they're both questions for you. So the first question is, which, which one of you, and please raise your hands, which one of you feels that your standard of living is better than that of your parents? If you're going to put the hand up, put it up a bit further, no? Okay. Okay, so pretty much all of you feel that, that your standard of living is better than the standard of living of your parents. Then my next question would be, which one of you expects that the standard of living of your children is going to be better than yours? Okay, that's slightly less, but still very many. So obviously <laughs> Poland is a, is a very optimistic uh, country. Things are on the way up in, in every sense, and you're confident that you're going to leave behind you a country, a planet, which is much better than what your parents were able to, to hand over to you. Um, and I wish, I must say, I wish I could feel the same level of confidence. Um, we're here, as Nick was saying, across the river from a, a climate change conference, a very big and important climate change conference. And I often wish that climate change was actually the only issue that we have to worry about. Because yes, I, I see very significant things happening on climate change, and, and, and Nick pointed to those in terms of the impacts that we're already seeing that we can expect. Um, next to that, you have major issues around energy prices and, and energy security in many parts of the world, with actually 1.3 trillion people uh, sorry, 1.3 billion people who don't even have access to electricity. So here we are across the river talking about reducing emissions, but there are 1.3 billion people who don't have anything to reduce. So major issues around energy prices and energy security. Water, I think, is, is going to be the major issue for the next 10, 20 to 30 years. Maybe not in Poland, but I think in, in many parts of the world where you're on the one hand um, seeing very severe droughts, which are getting worse, for example, um, in the north of Africa, where things are getting drier and drier, and then people try and flee into Europe. And instead of helping them, we buy more patrol boats to try and keep them out. So water is a, is a big issue. Not just in terms of drought, but also in terms of many parts of the world that are wet, that are getting significantly wetter. Think, for example, about all the extreme rain situations that we're seeing uh, on the Indian subcontinent. We are seeing 
serious issues around material scarcity and the prices of, uh, of materials. Uh, some of the optimists that I sometimes run into say, well, what are you worried about? We've only just begun mining above the level, uh, above sea level. Just think if we start scraping the ocean bo bottom, how much more we could find. But the fact of the matter is that around natural resources, around materials, rare earths, metals, etc., we are facing very significant uh, price increases. We are facing very serious issues around biodiversity loss, incidentally driven largely by climate change. We are confronted with very rapid deforestation around the world, and all of that is driven by a global population growth which is still continuing, 8.3 billion people probably on this planet by 2030. Uh, a population that's getting richer and richer, which is good. You know, between 2010 and 2030, the global middle class is going to double in size, but that also means a lot more people with a lot more spending power, putting a lot more pressure on those areas that I talked about. More and more of those more and more people who are more and more well off living in urban centers, which are massive concentrations of, uh, of environmental pressure. So each of those areas, climate, energy, food, water, biodiversity, forests, are in and of themselves significant enough. But what gets really scary from my perspective is if you look at the interaction between those issues. If you look, for example, at the relationship that exists between climate, energy, food, and water, in the sense that we should be producing 70% more food by the middle of the century to feed all those extra brothers and sisters. Um, to produce 70% more food, we need, at least in theory, 70% more water, which we don't have because of climate change. In fact, we have less water because you need a lot of water to produce energy. So there is not just the, those issues individually, but also the relationship between those issues. And, and that, for me, is a, is a pretty toxic mix uh, to the degree that, that if I were asked as a global citizen, um, do you think that the quality of life of your children is going to be better? Do I think that the quality of life of my children is going to be better than mine? Then I'm actually not all that confident to raise my hand, certainly as my children, um, who are actually some of whom are actually your age, but as my children get older. So I, I think the situation is that we're under multiple pressures, and yes, climate change is something serious to worry about, but, th but there is more out there. All of that leads me to the conclusion that, that really we have no choice. We have no choice to take things in a fundamentally different direction. We have no choice but to begin to price environmental externalities better, as Nick was indicating. We need to come to a true cost approach. Um, I have no issue, for those of you that can afford it, I have no issue with you sitting in your bathtub in the middle of December enjoying a strawberry while you have a glass of champagne providing you pay the cost of making a strawberry in the middle of winter instead of passing that environmental cost on to me. And the situation at the moment is that the price of most things that you buy today um, do not reflect the environmental cost. We, we did a, a study as KPMG about a year ago. We called it um, Expect the Unexpected, Building Business Value in a Changing World, where we looked at 11 sectors of the global economy and asked ourselves the, uh, the question, including based on information from TrueCost, what would happen if those 11 sectors of the global economy would have to internalize their environmental costs? In other words, what would happen if they would have to reflect the environmental cost of what they make in the price of the products that you buy? And the conclusion we came to was that industries across the board would lose about 40 cents in every dollar earned. In other words, the profitability of companies would go down by 40 percent if they had to internalize that environmental cost. That's the average. If the people in the food and beverage industry had to internalize their environmental costs, 
they would see their profitability wiped out twice over. They would see 200% of their profits lost because they have such an enormous impact on the environment through agriculture, through pesticides, through transportation methods, and because you, if you're average Europeans, at the end of the day, throw away uh, about half of what you, uh, what you buy. So in other words, there is at this moment in time a massive cost to the environment, a massive cost to society, which is not reflected in the price of what you choose to buy. And therefore, at least in a price sense, you are not confronted with the consequences of the choices that you decide to make. And that, of course, applies to me as well. So the situation I think we're in, if you look at those global trends and if you look at those, the mixture of those, that toxic mix of those global trends, is that we basically have no choice but to fundamentally change the way in which we produce and consume. But although we have no choice, we are not making that choice. The, the, Nick pointed to some, some bright points, some light points in terms of a number of companies that are successfully changing their business models. But by and large, you find that countries are very reluctant to really drive change, whether it's on, on climate change or on that broader sustainability agenda. And they're reluctant to do that for a number of reasons. They're reluctant to do that because they are afraid that if they go green, that their economies will suffer. You're probably all aware of the debate, the very active debate in this country in Poland about what would happen if Poland were to use less coal. What would that mean for employment in Poland? What would that mean for the cost of energy uh, in Poland? Speaking of energy security, what would that mean for, God forbid, your dependence on Russia for gas in the future? So that's one example of how many industrialized countries are afraid to change their direction because they are afraid they would be hurt competitively. Then you have another group of, of countries, the emerging economies like China, India, Brazil, who we have a bit of a tendency in the negotiations to view as the bad guys who don't want to cooperate. But actually those countries are very preoccupied with economic growth and with poverty eradication. Uh, I talked about 1.3 billion people who do not have access to electricity. 400 million of those people live in India. Um, there are 1.3 billion people who don't have access to modern energy. There are also 1.3 billion people who, don't, who are living currently on less than one dollar per day. And the imperative for the governments of their countries, for the government of China, for the government of India, is to lift those people out of poverty. I personally believe that China is sitting on a political time bomb in terms of a very poor rural population. And there is, it's very difficult then as a government to say, how can I find a way forward that, that might slow economic growth? Then you have in the international process countries that um, don't perhaps rely for more than 90% on coal the way that Poland does, but that rely for 90, 95, 96% of their economy on getting oil out of the ground. Think of all the oil producing countries in the Middle East that feel very threatened by action on, on climate change. And there are other countries which for different reasons are reluctant to, uh, to embark on, on this agenda. On, on top of that comes a disillusionment with the international political process. I talked about that major climate change conference in Copenhagen two years ago which I think many politicians left with a political hangover, with a loss of faith in the international political system, in the ability of the United Nations uh, to deliver. We had, after Copenhagen, an economic crisis in many parts of the world, a financial crisis in many parts of the world, uh, a Eurozone crisis in some parts of the world. Not in this one, you have your own currency. But that has led to, to politicians Politicians who, in some instances, I respect very much, like German Chancellor Merkel, a former environment minister who has always been a major advocate for action on climate change. And I sometimes have the feeling that nowadays Angela Merkel can only say one word, and that one word 
is Greece. So we're in a situation where the politicians are disillusioned with the international process, they're under economic pressure, and they basically don't see a clear um, way forward. And I think you could argue for many, that for many politicians, perhaps even for many ministers of economy, the notion of green growth, the notion of sustainable growth, is much more of a faith rather than a real conviction. People believe this is the direction in which we should be traveling. People believe that this is the right thing to do, but they don't know how to make it work in practice. And there is a massive fear to be a first mover to begin to drive that change. I'm not going to ask you to put your hands up again to say if you still think that the, the livelihood of your children is going to be better than yours, but I, I think I have painted a, a picture of a, of a political situation around the world, an environmental situation around the world, an economic situation around the world um, that is, is pretty depressing. The question then is what is going to lift us out of that situation? We are here, or people are across the river at a climate change conference uh, in Warsaw which is supposed to lay the foundation for a big new international agreement on climate change in 2050. A climate change agreement which is supposed to embrace all countries in terms of taking action. A climate change agreement which is supposed to take us to a global approach on, on climate change, which we need for competitiveness reasons, which we need for environmental reasons. A global approach in 2015 which is hopefully going to get us to that goal of avoiding a temperature increase of more than two degrees centigrade. At the moment, there is, is very little out there that gives me the confidence that that is the direction in which politicians are willing to go. Actually, I sometimes have the feeling that, that should you decide to leave the university and choose a different profession, that the easiest profession you can choose to go into is politics. Because the only thing that you need to be a successful political leader is followers. That sounds really easy. The question then from me to you, a question you don't need to answer now, is how are you going to be the followers that push the leaders in the right direction? My sense at this moment in time is that most politicians around the world feel absolutely no popular pressure to take things in a different direction. That most politicians around the world feel no pressure at this moment in time to come to an ambitious climate change agreement in 2015. That very few politicians at this moment in time, Nick gave the example of Costa Rica, the example of Denmark, but that there are actually very few politicians out there who are willing to take the risk of a fundamental change of direction. And to be honest, I think that they are only going to make that choice if they have the feeling that you are behind them, if they have the feeling that there is political backing, that there is popular backing for a fundamental change of direction. And my concern is that as we get closer to 2015, that if the politicians don't feel that popular pressure, do not feel that they're being encouraged to take a step in the right direction as opposed to the wrong direction, that Paris 2015 will fail in the same way that Copenhagen failed in 2009, that basically confidence will be lost in the international process, and your children will be confronted with all the consequences around climate, energy, food, water, material scarcity, biodiversity loss, and deforestation. I will leave you with that happy thought. Thank you.